Welcome back, Oakland County EMS providers. This is Section 5, the Adult Cardiac Treatment Protocols for the 2024 Protocol Implementation Education. The implementation of these protocols is scheduled for February 1st, 2024. My name is John Toit. I am the EMS System Manager at the Oakland County Medical Control Authority. And today joining me is Captain Kevin Snell. He's with the Oxford Fire Department. He is their EMS coordinator, and he's a member of the protocol committee. Well, this is Section 5. We're back with Captain Kevin Snell from the Oxford Fire Department. Kevin, tell us all about Section 5, and we'll start with 5-1. Good day, John. Thanks for having me. I'd like to go over the Section 5, which is most of our ACLS guidelines. We haven't seen too many changes. We're still following ACLS guidelines for most of these protocols, but we're just going to touch on some of the changes that we physically see in the protocols. So there's a lot of education in this protocol. We went back and forth about removing some of the education, talked with the state, and we ended up leaving a lot of it in here. That was something we were looking to do, but it didn't seem to work out in our favor. The first thing we're looking at is the reference for hypothermia. So once again, we added in the numbers, which is gonna be very easy to find these protocols when you, the boots on the ground, are out there treating patients. 2.11 hypothermia protocol, definitely something you're gonna to wanna to refer to during CPR if we have a cold patient. The other thing we see here with telephone, the contact metal control, cardiac arrest patients in the middle of CPR should only be moved if the scene is unsafe. Physical location of the patient doesn't allow good treatment, or medical control ordered it. Make sure we're doing CPR in place when possible and not just loading patients and moving them when unneeded. Hey John here, we're looking at the high quality CPR and defibrillation section and we see once again a reminder that we're consistent with American Heart Guidelines, which is our ACLS guidelines. They talk about the anterior posterior placement of pads. It's preferred when possible. I know this is something very difficult. People laying in between the toilet and the tub with all their clothes on and their winter jacket and trying to get a pad on their back but it's just something to be considered that, if possible, we can stack the pads front to back. With defibrillation of all our devices, we are still going to be following the manufacturer's recommendation. If you do not know the recommendations of your manufacturer for giving your defibrillation doses, you should give the maximum available on that unit. We were able to get the state to move a lot of the education out of the procedure portion of the protocol. What you're going to find is the education is in front and the procedure has a lot less education in it so that if you need to find something in a hurry, you can find something in a hurry. Under operational considerations, prior to advanced airway placement, this isn't something we're going to do often, but if we're on scene and we're doing 30 to 2, they want to remember to make sure we're taking a look at the monitor to see if we have any kind of rhythm change during those ventilations when we're not doing compression. So this is kind of a common sense thought process here, but just something to remember, try to look at the monitor when possible. If an AED has been applied, whether it's BLS personnel or, you know, police on scene, and you're an ALS unit, make sure we're switching to the cardiac monitor after the initial defibrillation. We shouldn't continue to use an AED in manual mode when we have a cardiac monitor available. Scrolling down here to high quality CPR, manual chest compressions are the standard of care and the mechanical chest compression devices where many departments, we consider the Lucas our firefighter of the year, but you know, just remember manual chest compressions are still the standard of care when possible. And remember, there are suggestions on when you should use the mechanical compression device, inadequate numbers of rescuers available, CPR during hypothermic cardiac arrest, CPR in a moving ambulance. These are examples. There are other things that you could cite. Refer to protocol 7.29, mechanical chest compression, the procedure protocol. And in your patient care record, just note the reason to why you chose to use the mechanical compression device if you go down that road. That's a great, great thought, John. Thanks for adding that. And we did not choose to keep the impedance threshold device protocol or the active compression, the decompression device protocol. Those protocols were not accepted by the medical control. They were optional. Getting down into the procedure protocols, there's not a lot of difference here. It's just kind of structured differently. So we're still doing the same thing that we did in our previous protocols. 
It's just the way that it's rewritten here, hopefully to make it easier for people to read. Just glance through this area and make sure that you still understand the order. And, it's and make sure you guys are monitoring the untitled CO2. That is now something that is a requirement. The state has been moving towards this, and they want to make sure that that is being monitored on all patients during cardiac arrest and even really sick patients now. And again, if ROSC isn't achieved after 30 minutes of ALS time and the patient is in asystole, that's when you contact medical control, refer to protocol 7.6. Again, there's some notes here at the end. Just talk about, remember, hey, look for your H's and T's. Yeah, sometimes on those scenes, it gets very difficult. And once again, it's our common sense reminders for our providers just to give you a reference to look through to remember those things. All right, the next protocol is protocol 5-2, bradycardia. So bradycardia is the same. Once again, we're following AHA CLS guidelines here. The only major change in this protocol was that the note for sedation was removed for TCP. So you'll no longer find that in the bradycardia protocol. That doesn't mean that you cannot contact medical control and ask for sedation. Refer to the sedation protocol for direction on that. That reference was just removed. Tachycardia 5.3. Tachycardia. So tachycardia did exactly what all the providers hate. It went from two pages to four pages. The information here is still the same. It's still current with our AHA CLS guidelines. The protocol was just restructured. First thing we're looking for is whether they're stable or unstable. If they're unstable, we're obviously going to treat that immediately. If they get into the stable criteria, it's going to break down to narrow complex and wide complex, regular and narrow rhythms, irregular rhythms, and determine what we're going to do. They added in these little graphic arts for us on the modified Valsalva maneuver, getting somebody's heart rate lowered. Still given adenosine. And just remember, adenosine is only given in monomorphic regular rhythms. Protocol 5 4 pulmonary edema. Cardiogenic shock. This is one of those shock protocols you referred to in section one. Absolutely, John. Once again, when we're trying to put all our brains together and think the same way, some people may not go to this protocol. They may go to shock, and hopefully the shock will now lead them to this protocol when this is pertinent. So the major change we see here with crackles, administering nitroglycerin on patients, we didn't have a maximum number in here prior. You could just administer nitro as long as their pressure was good. The med control group here decided that we we're going to maximize our nitro doses to three. When we scroll down here to 8AI, we see administer 20 micrograms of push dose epi. The funny thing about the prior protocol is it listed the volume, but not the dose. So that was something in the protocol committee that we caught and we wanted to make sure we address. It used to say administer one to two milliliters. We wanted to make sure that the dose was in here. So it's administer 20 mics. And again, all of these follow the ACLS guidelines set forth by the American Heart Association. The next one is chest pain, acute coronary syndrome, section 5.5. Five. So the chest pain protocol here, other than adding in the reference numbers to the other protocols to refer to, is going to be the same. We did have the removal of the possible inferior wall, MI, during the nitroglycerin administration. We decided that as long as the pressure was good, you could administer nitroglycerin. Down here at 11B, between boluses, assess the patient response for pulmonary edema. This is one of those common sense things we learn in school. If we're giving fluid to somebody and we're overloading them and we start getting crackles in the lungs or some pulmonary edema, we definitely want to stop giving our fluid boluses and then contacting medical control for how to get that fixed. And then last but certainly not least, an improvement to this section something that we pulled out of section one and split up and put in section five and section six, ROSC. Absolutely, John. This was something I think we all had on our top three priorities during the protocol review was we got to get ROSC out of section one and get it into section five. When, when the boots are on the ground or in during cardiac arrest and we're already in section five, staying there to find ROSC was just made so much more sense. Here we see ROSC patients, they're going to have a reference to 3.7, which is the crashing adult treatment protocol, which is something you might think about. It's no longer considered end title. It's definitely do use our end title CO2. Monitor our waveform. Keep an eye on 
what our capnography is during compressions and especially during ROSC. And hopefully we want to try to get a range between 35 and 45. Hypotension, we see push dose epinephrine. We can prepare push dose epinephrine while we're given a fluid bolus. As we remember in ROSC care in AHA, we talk about one to two liters of fluid prior to giving basal pressors. But in the protocol here, what they're telling us is it's okay to get your push dose measured and ready while you're administering your fluid bolus. Excellent. And that's all for section five. Kevin, thank you for joining us again. And we'll be moving on to section six soon. Excellent. Thank you for having me, John. I really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, Oakland County EMS providers. We've just completed section five. We are on our way to section six. If you have any questions, contact qi at ocmca.org.